to cut it short. Uh, Manisha, thanks for joining as well. We have to cut across to our young industry. women who are going to be charting out their course right. in life. And, uh, you know, I would typically not start with your educational qualifications, but I really want to because what a checkered career you've had, but what a checkered past you've had as well. Harvard, Yale, Oxford, a Rhodes Scholar. How do you feel, Gina Raimondo, being back in a classroom today <laughs> uh, here in India speaking to these young girls? Yeah. Well, uh, to be very truthful, when I first walked in, I felt a little old <laughs> because <laughs> that, that makes the two of us. <laughs> seeing these young women, I was thinking, oh my goodness, college, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you all look so young, and that makes me optimistic for our future. You know, first of all, how exciting to be here the day after International Women's Day and uh, Women's History Month. Uh, yesterday, I had the opportunity to participate in the Holy um, celebration. Did you have fun? Uh, so fun. Uh, I had uh, three shampoos, though, to <laughs> get through the rest of my day. But, yeah, look, I'm, I'm, it's really exciting and special for me uh, to be here, I think, and to hear what a special college this is. And I would just say that um, so many of, of us have paved the way for you and would just tell you that you have all the talent and skill and education uh, to go forward in whatever path you choose, government, uh, journalism, business, but do something, yeah? Do something, not for yourselves, but because what you have to contribute to the world needs to be contributed. And I, I think that is the perfect message to send out here this morning, not just to the young women who are in this room, but to the many who are watching this program as well. But Secretary, I want to talk to you about the India-US relationship since you are here leading a large US delegation. You've just met with venture capitalists and young Indian entrepreneurs. There's a thriving startup ecosystem here. You know, a few weeks ago when that historic Air India Boeing deal was inked, you said that this is a thriving relationship. I want to understand from you, as you sit here in India, what do you believe the future looks like as far as this relationship is concerned? What are you most confident of? What are you most optimistic about? Yeah, well, I should say we are very optimistic overall. Uh, so that deal that you referenced was, uh, was for hundreds of airplanes from Boeing. Uh, which, which we think and believe will lead to many more, uh, which will create many jobs here in India and many jobs back at home in the United States. And that's just, of course, one deal. But we, I've just come from meeting with several entrepreneurs, uh, women, by the way, the, uh, several women, uh, several women who run um, unicorns, you know, mm -hmm. billion dollar business, mm -hmm. privately held businesses here. I think there's so much, you know, India is already a large trading partner with the United States. Uh, we share democracy, we share uh, common values, and we, uh, I am here, I, I brought 10 leading U.S. CEOs with me, They're, as you say, a large delegation. I think that they're, as you say, they, it's a, it's a, we're hoping to enter a new era of even increased trade. Uh, and that is why we ha have so much optimism. You know, when you talk about a new era of increased trade between both sides, can you quantify that for us? I mean, what is the aspiration? What is it that you believe uh, is the true potential and where do you believe we could be in the next five years in terms of trade? Yeah, you know, I don't know if I have a number per se, I think, uh, but the rate at which India is growing I mean, by some estimates, India is the fastest growing, you know, large mm -hmm. economy. Uh, the rate at which you are growing, you know, people, the, the group we just came from is talking about a doubling of, you know, certain kind of business in the near term. I think that <coughs> tech, there is a lot to be mm -hmm. said for uh, the relationships we already have as among uh, U.S. tech companies and Indian tech companies. Uh, so I think that, um, and you know, the supply, I, I think we're going to talk about supply chains mm -hmm. in a little bit. I mean, I think there's just huge opportunities in what India has, not only a you know, billion plus people, uh, a large English speaking population, mm -hmm. a well trained population, a stable business environment, a strong rule of law, yeah. uh, a, a, a vibrant democracy. Uh, a long history of doing business with the United States, 
all of that is so important for us to build on. You know, you preempted my question on supply chain resilience, and let me address that issue because the U.S. commercial, U.S.-India commercial dialogue has restarted after a gap of three yes. years, and I'm yes. given to understand that supply chain resilience is going to be a key focus area of the dialogue between both sides. What should that uh, lead to? What are the outcomes that you're hopeful of from the dialogue restarting? Yes. So we are restarting it. Um, we'll be having a meeting tomorrow. I'll be here with my counterpart, Minister Piyush Goyal, and we'll be uh, restarting that, again, with the feeling of optimism. Uh, look, I think that COVID really opened the world's eyes to how vulnerable our supply chains were. Mm. And uh, supply chains are often too concentrated in a particular geography. And so that leaves you vulnerable to not just COVID, but any kind of a natural disaster, geopolitical tensions, et cetera. And so U.S. companies, many of which I have with me on this visit, mm -hmm. are interested to diversify their supply chains. You know, I'll give you a statistic. Last year in the United States, uh, Ford Motor Company, the employees of Ford Motor Company making cars in the U.S. state of Michigan only worked a full week three times in the year. Wow. The reason was because they couldn't access enough semiconductors. Mm -hmm. And nowadays in cars, you know, an electric vehicle, there's over a thousand semiconductors. They couldn't get the semiconductors even for the windshield wipers. So they couldn't assemble the car. My point is uh, we're not producing enough semiconductors and we're getting them all from either just Taiwan or just packaged mm -hmm. in Malaysia, and it exposes us to incredible uh, disruptions. So I think what India offers is, I think India stands to gain actually quite tremendously from the move for multinational companies wanting to be more resilient in their supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, staying with the issue of supply chain resilience, and you talked about the semiconductor shortage, and it wasn't just U.S. companies that were impacted. Companies here in India and across the world were impacted on account of specifically the semiconductor shortage that we saw. So on that front, the U.S. has made its intention very clear to manufacture semiconductors in the U.S. The CHIPS Act has been passed. Uh, I know you have said previously that America needs to lead this, and it is America's obligation to lead this. In India, we've just announced a package to also push uh, semiconductor manufacturing. But where do you then see the headroom for potential partnership and mm. collaboration between India and the U.S. when both sides are hoping to manufacture domestically? Yeah, and both can. Both can. Certainly our goal is not to be self-sufficient. You know, so, you know, for, so for example, in semiconductors now, the United States and the world actually is, is overly dependent on Taiwan. 93% of the world's most advanced semiconductors are produced in Taiwan. That isn't, by no measure is yeah. that stable or resilient. Yeah, now, but having said that, we never expect to make all of the semiconductors that, in America that we consume. That is not the goal. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have, and I have said this many times, a desire to work closely with our allies, including India, as we make this investment. You know, one of the dangers of any kind of industrial policy like this is you don't coordinate with your allies, mm -hmm. you compete with your allies, and so there's a race, you know, a subsidy race. Uh, and or there's a glut, you know, if, if Europe is considering a similar subsidy, if we all put our subsidy into the same area, you have a glut of one kind of chip and not enough of another. Mm -hmm. So the challenge here, which is a, it's complicated, mm -hmm. this is a very complex situation is, uh, but I think women can think in like 3D, <laughs> uh, is to work with our allies to, sh to create a deep um, ecosystem in the United States but also, I think there's jobs to be created in India, mm -hmm. you know, and I think in also our national security interests uh, in many ways are aligned. And so I think it makes sense that we would work together. And if I can just follow that up with, uh, you know, where is the engagement on this front with the Indian government as far as semiconductors specifically are concerned? Because as you said, uh, it serves our interest from a security standpoint, but at the end of the day, you also don't want to end up in a situation of overcapacity, and that's something that the yes. World Bank, etc., have cautioned countries about. So how do you balance, and it is going to be a yes. fine balance, as you point out. 
It will be difficult. So I don't want to break any news today that I'm not supposed to. <laughs> I was to, hoping. <laughs> but, you know, um, I'm working very closely with my counterpart. Uh, and tomor tomorrow we'll have the official meetings of the CEO forum and the commercial dialogue. And we've been talking a great deal about semiconductors. And so uh, we will have a, f a formal discussion as between the U.S. government and the India government of India around semiconductors. How do we purposefully strategize and plan? Uh, you know, for example, um, India is home to a massive amount of uh, semiconductor design mm. talent. The United States uh, leads the world in semiconductor design. We have a <coughs> synergy there. Um, having said that, you know, this, this, it's a semiconductor supply chain is incredibly complex mm -hmm. from rare earths, critical minerals, chemicals, silicon, actual manufacturing. So although I am not naive to the complexity, yeah. I am optimistic that working with our allies and having this dialogue will accrue to the benefit of both of our countries. Well, you know, you have given us a headline that there is going to be a purposeful dialogue uh, between <laughs> India and the U.S. on specifically on the issue of uh, semiconductors. But let me extend this uh, thesis on friend shoring forward because both yeah. you as well as Secretary Yellen have talked about that. And what do you see friend shoring extending itself to in the context of the India-U.S. partnership? Uh, well, once again, I think um, we, U.S. companies, many of whom I have with me, are all going through an analysis of their supply chains to figure out where, their, um, where there's risk. And some companies will find that they are uh, very, very, very heavily uh, dependent on China, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's a desire for them to diversify. And so I think that uh, India will prove to be an excellent, an excellent place, you know, for these companies to think about investing. You know, since you spoke about China specifically, there's a question that's come in from one of our faculty members here at Jesus and Mary College, uh, which focuses on exactly that issue. Uh, Dr. Jasmine says, what is the potential for India-U.S. trade given the U.S.'s heavy dependence on China for manufactured goods? If you can shed some light on what this could mean as far as India moving up the global value chain and partnering with the U.S. Yeah. Well, look, I think it's true. Look, China still... Um produces about 30% of uh, global manufacturing production. India is at about 3%. The United States is 15 plus percent. Those numbers speak for themselves. You know, I think there's tremendous headroom for India on uh, growing. And as you, as I said before, you have a large workforce, well-educated, increasingly well-educated. Prime Minister Modi's investments in infrastructure, uh, digitization, uh, digital payments, you know, all uh, provide uh, greater confidence by companies to want to do business here. It's why we come with so much optimism. Uh, and again, you do not under, do not, you cannot um, overestimate the value of a democracy, a strong, vibrant democracy, rule of law, court system, Etc. Uh, and so I think that all of that positions India so well uh, as a play as a place for businesses to want to do business. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, speaking of uh, India being the place to want to do business, and I'll ask you this in the context of the IPAF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which you've been championing and yes, leading, yes, yes. leading from the front. You've also previously said that this has been the most successful uh, dialogues uh, that you've you've had the uh, chance to sort of steer and take forward. What makes it so special? Yeah. So the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, when, when President Biden came into office, he said to us on his team, the United States needs to have a proactive economic strategy in the Indo-Pacific. And I'll be very candid, for the four or five years prior to that, the United States was absent mm. in the Indo-Pacific. You know, I said that yesterday. I had a series of meetings and dinners last night. You know, we haven't shown up our private sector, our governments, so we need to do that. And the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is just that. 
Uh, it is a coalition of 13 countries, mm -hmm. and we're so grateful to have India participating and all the ASEAN countries uh, agreeing to government-to-government -government agreements around supply chains. Yes. There's a supply chain pillar, uh, decarbonization and infrastructure, tax and anti-corruption, and digital trade. And the, we are moving forward at a speed that is uh, kind of unprecedented. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I was with the president. He announced it last year uh, in, Japan, in Tokyo. Uh, within months, we were all together. We signed off to the negotiating statements. In fact, your minister, Minister Goyal, said it was, he was like shocked <laughs> with the speed with which we were moving. Uh, I think uh, I'm hopeful by the end we of this year. We don't have any wood yet, There's no, no something here. <laughs> I'm hopeful by the end of, by the end of this year. Uh, we could we could have all of the agreements as between the governments uh, all signed populous. up. This is my hope and goal. You know, uh, my mother would say to me, if you have something done, give it to a busy woman. So <laughs> I'm a busy woman, and I'm hoping to get this done by the end of the year. But, you know, it's, it's and then my, the, the, once we have those government-to-government -government agreements, uh, committing ourselves to high standards around anti-corruption, transparency in supply chain, uh, environmental conditions, mm. it will open the path to more business, you know, private sector investment. Mm. I should tell you, in preparation for my trip here, I spoke to dozens of U.S. investors, U.S. CEOs, U.S. entrepreneurs. There is a desire mm. f f to do more business here. And so when you have, for example, um, agreements as between governments around transparency in the supply chain or uh, it's tax transparency, it just will ease the path for more investment. You know, speaking of the path for more investment and easing the path for more investment, as you said, that U.S. businesses that you've spoken to are keen to invest more in India, either fresh investments or incremental investments. Is there any, are there any constraints at this point in time uh, that they would like addressed? There's always constraints. You know, there's always constraints, and I think you could, it's on both ends to be fair. Uh, one of the issues that you do hear from uh, U.S. businesses, and we talked about mm -hmm. semiconductors, uh, India still has quite high tariffs on certain components that go into semiconductors or other electronics. And so, you know, if you have a high tariff on an input, it just makes it harder to manufacture here. Uh, you hear from, from investors that uh, it, it would be easier. It's, it's sometimes foreign direct investment is a little bit too difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, dif differences as between states in India, differences as between regulation at the state level and the federal level. Uh, and to be candid, uh, when you talk to Indian, I was just with an Indian entrepreneur, a startup company, and he said, it's hard in America. It's every state has their own different yes. rules. So, you know, I'm conscious of that. But the truth of it is, any time, having run a business myself, any time you can increase transparency and reduce uh, layers of bureaucracy and regulation, it does uh, ease the path for more commerce. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. I think one of the challenges that people are cognizant of uh, and policymakers are cognizant of at this point in time is, again, finding that balance between promoting domestic manufacturing, domestic yeah. trade, and exports as well. I mean, India at this point in time, much a smaller portion of uh, global trade. But as, as the U.S. Commerce Secretary, how are you treading this path between uh, how open you need to be versus how you protect your domestic interests? Yeah, you see, this is, of course, a very complicated question. And as I said earlier, we have no illusions that it would be a good thing to produce all that we need to consume. And uh, having said that, as President Biden would say, the president says he's done being just the end of the supply mm -hmm. chain. You know, the United States has to have, uh, for our national security and our economic security, you know, we are for certain goods like semiconductors, um, pharmaceutical ingredients mm -hmm. that go into our most basic medicine, even, even basic antibiotics, uh, critical minerals, 
we have become just overly dependent on other countries. And so it is a, it is a balance. This is a constant balance between uh, letting the free market uh, prevail and, and, and globalization and global trade, all good things. We can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, but also making sure that, uh, you know, if, there's a level playing field. Mm. I think that's such an important thing. I mean, to have a level playing field, to have labor standards, to have uh, competitive practices, to not allow, uh, you know, anti-competitive practices, dumping, or so government subsidy of industries. I mean, it's. But if you have a level playing field mm. and certain high standards. Uh, you, you ought to be able to have, you know, global trade at levels which create joint prosperity. But again, I think we have just, in the United States, we've lost our, we took our eye off the ball of manufacturing in search of cheap labor, mostly in uh, Asian countries. And we have to be aware of the national defense vulnerabilities that has created. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your mission at the Commerce Department is to create opportunity and competitiveness. Uh, and uh, one of the questions that's coming from actually one of the students here, Sanya Jave, the economics third year students who sent us this question, um, since we were talking about self-reliance. There, there she is. So I'm, I'm going to read out your question to the Commerce Secretary. While keeping India's emphasis on self-reliance in the backdrop of India's growing uh, industry in the context of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework negotiations, how are the U.S. and India working together to ensure a level playing field for business, promote sustainable development and issues related to climate and energy security as well? Yeah, great question. And uh, again, as I said in the beginning, it, this is an area that I think we need you, your bright minds to help us. I mean, the, to meet the challenges of climate change, we are utterly dependent on technologies and innovations that haven't been developed. You know, that is just a fact. Um, so the third pillar, one of the pillars of the IPEF, is uh, decarbonization mm -hmm. and infrastructure. And by the way, they're linked. The days of having investments in infrastructure, roads, bridges, ports, et cetera, that aren't sustainable have to be over. Yeah? Have to be over. We have to push ourselves towards clean steel, clean cement, your green cement, green steel. And so that's, we have high hopes for that, um, for the government to government uh, contracts and relationships in the IPEF. Because if we can agree to a certain set of principles and targets and goals as it relates to sustainability and decarbonization, uh, that will unlock a great deal of innovation as between our countries. And in this regard, I mean, um, President Biden and Prime Minister Modi are both extremely serious uh, about this, and I think that's important. I can tell you there is a huge interest by U.S. clean tech entrepreneurs, U.S. infrastructure investors, U.S. Um, uh, green tech investors, solar, hydrogen, et cetera, in India. And that's why I think once we can come to agreement on the negotiated terms of these environmental standards and sustainability standards, um, it really is going to unlock a lot of innovation and, quite frankly, a lot of capital and investment in India.